Um, and so we're recording. Uh, and what I want to do first is just quickly, especially for you know, for the sake of the folks who end up watching this. Um, and Ed probably didn't know I was going to do this. So Ed, if I mess this up or you can add anything to it but our guest this evening is ed barker and i'm sharing my screen right now ed is the um i've got a little bio pulled from your website uh, assistant director of research technology high performance computing kennesaw state university uh, graduate student at georgia institute of technology school of public policy in the ivan allen college founder and president of the stem leadership foundation uh, director of kel robotics and kel uh, is a first robotics competition team, uh, first Hall of Fame team as of last year. Uh, they received the Chairman's Award at the Houston Championships. Uh, and primarily, the, uh, just very briefly about Kel, is that um, Kel's, and, and Ed, you can talk a little bit more about this too, is that you're, you're an FRC team based out of Kel High School in Marietta, Georgia. Uh, I wanted to kind of say, enrollment there, I wanted to mention this is that is right around 1559 or 1560. Uh, for those of us in Indiana that, that end up watching this or take part in the call, I'll give you an idea. Kokomo High School, which is home to team 45, uh, is 1630 enrollment. And, um, and then Franklin Community High School is, uh, is 1590. So that kind of gives you an idea of, um, you know, what the size of Kell as compared to um, the uh, other schools here in the state of Indiana. Um, and um, also with Kell, um, I put on here just, just also so that um, folks could see, uh, this is a, a school that does have, you know, a third of their students are free and reduced lunch. So uh, when we look at Kell um, being a, a a top end chairman's team. This is a, by all measures, this is a, a high school that we have very, we have several high schools in the state of Indiana and some of our teams are based out of schools that are just like this. Um, and so I think it's, um, it's fantastic what they've been doing. Uh, one of the things here is the team has started a record setting 25 first robotics teams in Georgia and South Carolina. That's why we've got Ed on the phone. Um, and a third of those are in title one and underserved communities. So with that, Ed, please, if there's anything else that I missed, uh, go ahead and add to it, especially about yourself and or Kel, would be great. Well, the only thing that uh, was missed was, because uh, it wasn't on the website, is that don't let the fact that I'm a graduate student uh, fool you. I'm 62 years old. I'm not 26 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm an old graduate student, so I've been around the block. <clears throat> but uh, no, I think that's about uh, it. I will say, I've always tell people when they ask about what kind of school Kell is, or they're a magnet school or something, I say they are the average American high school. I mean, they're so plain vanilla average, it's crazy. Well, and I think that's what I, I, I certainly didn't want to put, I hope that you didn't think or anybody else ends up watching this or listening to this thinks that I'm putting Kell down. I think that, um, that's the great thing about what you guys have been able to do is that, you know, you're, you are just a, you know, there's, uh, it's, it's not a specific STEM school. It's not a, um, it's not a private school that you have to apply to get into that's specific to any one thing. It's a, it's a public high school, like many of the ones that we, we have here, uh, all over the United States and in Indiana. So, um, so I think that what you guys have been able to do there with starting other teams, I think that's what I'd like to, maybe kind of shift to now is when we talk about starting FRC teams and, and we have Jim Langfelt on the call as well. I'll uh, unmute him here in a few minutes to talk a little bit about how Penn has helped. Um, we also have another team here in Indiana Castle. They're a, a third year team uh, down in the Evansville area. Uh, Lyle Oxley, their lead mentor, uh, couldn't be on the call tonight, but I can talk a little bit about what, what Castle has been able to do. Um, in terms of also helping us bring uh, some teams on to last year and, and helping again this year with a few. So uh, what has been your guys' approach at Cal um, to start all these FRC teams? Has there been one trick? Has there been one pitch? Is there, you know, so if you guys could just talk a little bit about how that's happened. Well, um, 
I think the easiest way to understand it is put in historical context. Uh, this is my 14th year. So when I got in, Georgia was really tiny and most people didn't know what robotics was. And it kind of looked actually kind of funny. But, you know, we did a lot of outreach events. And so when we did our outreach events, it had multiple purposes. One was just name brand recognition, just to get out and excite some kids. You know, if, I, if, if 10,000 people would come by and we can meet two of the right people, you know, they might turn into sponsors. Inevitably, you start some conversations with some people that might be interested in how do you get involved in this. You would have to follow up the lead, um, maybe visit the school, maybe invite students from that school to be on our team this year. It was There was no single silver bullet, but one thing was we had to stay in, stay connected to the community through as many channels as we could. You know, just to sort of uh, engage people. And anytime you're doing an engagement, you're actually doing multiple types of engagement. I can't overemphasize that. And you, you're, you're network building. So, you know, you build that network, you have these conversations, and you take some chances. And sometimes you go and strike out and don't get the team started. And sometimes you get it started. Um, we actually had our own space for a while, and we'd actually have some teams, probably half a dozen of them, incubated right out of our build space. Um, students from other high schools in the district, you know, were on the team, which eventually developed their own teams. There was no silver bullet there. It was just a lot of slugging away. Okay. So when you guys were doing these outreach events and you, you mentioned, you know, finding the right people or talking to the right people. Um, so when you're uh, a lot of teams in Indiana, do a lot of great outreach, uh, going to community fairs and festivals or going to, um, other other place to travel around the state or even Chicago for big events. Um, did, did you have a system for, I mean, I don't want to overthink it or engineer it, but were you getting people to sign up for emails? Were you, uh, were the students engaging folks? And then, you know, how were you tracking these people back down? Actually, the way conversations were, whether it's team development or sponsor development is, you know, the kids, you might be running the show and working with the little kids or doing whatever it is. And, I'm kind of standing around just having conversations with adults and just sort of almost politicking kind of work in the crowd, just chatting things up. And, you know, you might talk to a hundred people and two of them are strikes. You know, you actually, you know, you get some traction on. <laughs> um, I will tell you the climate has changed a lot here in the past few years. You know, when I started, nobody knew what robotics was. It seems like everybody does now. There are a lot of teams out there doing a lot of outreach. Um, I think, actually, I think some of the team, George, has gotten a little complacent in that and probably need to step up their game a little bit more just to sort of keep things moving. Um, we volunteer for, like, statewide science Olympiad, you know, competition is at Kennesaw State University. You know, we have students volunteer to just to help there. Sometimes we ring the robot. Sometimes we <clears> – <throat> this year is the first time we never bought a robot because it rained. <clears throat> But just that constant social engagement with educational leaders, you know, like from the school districts that are in at this thing, um, you know, it builds a network of people. So that when someone says, hey, I got a question, da, 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 and they'll say, oh, I know this guy, Kel Robotics, da, da, da. And the conversation continues. You know, the networks, the sociology of it, I think is important. Yeah, you know, we like to look at the robots and stuff, or some people do. I'm more worried about the social connections and just building the networks, just like you would in a business or any kind of entrepreneurial organization. And entrepreneurial is a big underpinning to this thing here. So you, uh, I noticed in the uh, Hall of Fame information, besides the uh, information about how you guys had started so many teams, um, you, you, uh, your team is also working on um, STEM educator work with the state? Yeah, and <clears throat> the team, <coughs> there's, that's really, that's a, there's a whole PhD right there, but the way this thing started was, I remember sitting in the stands at the championship 10 years ago this spring, thinking, I gotta figure out how to institutionalize this thing. And, which meant really trying to figure out how education works, and it took me years to figure that out. But one of the things that, had, that I knew had to happen is we had to develop a network of people we could talk to that had influence. Now, I'm an old guy, 62 years old. You know, yeah, politicians hear that all the time. Some old guy just calling up complaining. 
But I'll tell you what, if you want to get into somebody's office, get the kids to be the spear of you know, the point of that spear. And you set up, you know, your presentation, your meeting, your briefing. Politicians love to talk to kids and then, you know, you can be there with them and really make sure that you're landing the right kind of message and you're building that network. Uh, and we started doing that in 2009 with Governor Purdue. And then we called up the congressman and said, hey, we'd like to come see you. And they're kind of like, eh, yeah, we just got a governor's office. Okay, you're in. And then we would call the senator's office and told him we'd get out of the congressman's office. And that just snowballed into this giant set of dominoes. But the trick was to go in and try and figure out. In the early days, we were kind of explaining what robotics was about. Over time, we got much more refined and focused on figuring out what the real problem is and what the ask needed to be. So just to give you an example, we met with Senator Johnny Isaacson in 2010 and built a great relationship with him in 2010. 2015 comes around. The ESSA bill was in the House. Another version was in the Senate. And the I think it was the Senate bill was broken. It cut out all the money that was intended for first. So, okay, Senator, we had a conversation in 2010, October, whatever. Here's my notes. Here's what we talked about. We had a conference call with Washington and Atlanta and say, this is what needs to happen in the ESSA reconciliation. The bill went the committee, came back out, our way. Now, so the, the bill came out right. The authorization came out right. The preparation is still not right. So we got to go back and work on that. But a bigger point is, over time, we built this network of people they're all talking to each other and when they start talking about education and robotics inevitably they say hey you know this kill robotics thing da 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 um you know you got to be in the game you got to have that brand recognition which is you know it's work yeah <laughs> okay well no that's that's great stuff to hear i know um uh, I was able to attend the National Advocacy Conference last year, and, and we have some uh, Indiana students attending this year. So it's a step forward in the right direction for advocacy. Uh, we do have uh, some teams who have started the process statewide here. We've started to engage local legislators uh, to get to competitions, uh, to learn more about FIRST. We just had a budget, um, a budget year. We're on a biennial budget. And so, right. so now uh, I think is, uh, what we're hoping to do here now is is lay the foundation for uh, the next uh, budget, the next biennial budget, and start to look at some different grant programs and things like that. So, um, so it sounds like in terms of team growth, you guys were just out there, just actively pursuing schools, uh, trying to incubate. I like this idea um, where you had students coming in and and you incubated a team out of your shop and sent them back off. It's it's sort of like a foundation might incubate nonprofits. Um, I think that's a very good way to do it is the incubation process uh, because at that point you got the students bought in and when the students get bought in and they can start dragging their parents and teachers in and that makes it a lot harder for the district or, or a school to resist it at that point. So did you face any problem from your school district about uh, incubating like having kids from other schools in your shop doing this stuff? <clears throat> and Oh <laughs> Uh, we have to get into economics to get into that one. In 2009, the economy crashed in September with the Goldman Sachs thing and all that. You know, they were laying off thousands of teachers and everybody was crouched down in their foxholes, uh, you know, nationally and teachers. You know, it, was a, it was a big mess. And then by 2011, um, we wound up um, moving out of the school. The What, what happened was is they cut down so many personnel and so they had like one auditor to audit like 110 school accounts for the clubs. And they came around to, on a five-year cycle to Kel and says, okay, you see this drama club, you know, pizza, whatever, 200 bucks. And then we're running some monstrous giant budget and money's thrown through first and everything else. They're like, we can't even figure this out. We don't know what to do. And so long story short, the uh, county that said, got our law firm together and we worked out a deal where we're separated from the school preserved all assets and by school policy nationally if you disband a club from a, a school the school gets all the property well they gave us all the property all the tools all of everything we took everything including the brands logos and images 
And then we set up shop across down the road for six and a half years in a donated space. And, and that was the Kill Robotics Innovation Center. And that's where we incubated most of these teams from was out of that space. Um, and then we moved back in June 1st of last year. And so, and they are screamingly glad to have us back. But the economy has changed. You know, they're hiring t- teachers. We just gave the entire state of Georgia a pay raise for teaching. You know, we're hiring all the teachers back. We're getting big in STEM education. It's a very different environment than what it was 10 years ago, eight years ago. But having students from other schools in, especially in district, in district schools, is absolutely zero problem. They can just be on the team if they wanted to be. Right. But if they were out of district, then uh, it was okay because you were in your own facility. But now that you're back at Kell, would you face issues if you tried to do that, or? Well, I wouldn't put it on the I wouldn't put it on the nightly news right now. But as part <laughs> of us moving back into the school, we grandfathered every kid that we had homeschooler, um, oh, wow. out of district people, the whole deal. <laughs> okay. Uh, I I told them says you know they didn't press me on. I says but I says over time I'm gonna I'm going to reduce that. Okay. We're going to start unwinding all that uh, out of district stuff. Okay. But uh, no, they were glad to do it. Of course, we had a little bit of prestige coming with it too. So <laughs> nobody argued sure. with us. <laughs> sure. Well, that makes sense. Um, well, no, I th- and, and we do have, we have some community-based teams here in the state. Um, the community-based teams certainly have a little more flexibility. Uh, and then really it's it, our school-based teams. Um, we have some that, uh, do allow homeschool students uh, in, uh, some don't, it's just kind of a mixture. So really it's just kind of, th- there's no statewide policy, it's just kind of a, a district by district um, That's a, policy decision. Same thing in Georgia, there are people that are pushing to make it a, a law to allow homeschoolers so that people can play football. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, uh, I, I I guess it's a nice thing that it's a district by district policy, but um, yeah, I, I don't really have any judgment either way. I just, um, I know that it has created some community programs that are mostly homeschool cohorts. And then we do have a, uh, several FTC programs that are homeschool cohorts uh, that uh, do really well. Um, it's uh, more conducive to their numbers and, and things like that. Uh, um, so, well, uh, is anything else in terms of the FRC growth? Um, that well, you I want to that, that you could, in terms of advising Indiana teams. Are there some things that they could do, like this summer, this fall? Uh, you know, besides you know, besides kind of you know, they're going to do some. They're going to be out there doing some outreach. And so, one big piece of advice that I'm I'm taking away from this is while you're doing outreach. Yeah, have the kids showing off the robots, be supervising, but be looking for and, and trying to make connections and start uh, start trying to get those folks to either visit your shop or learn more about FRC and, and then uh, somehow get get them uh, <coughs> make make connections at these events is I guess the big takeaway for me. But but are there some other things? Well, you know, anytime you're the network building is constant, you know, it's network building with other kids and have them engaged either on the team or around the team or somehow visiting the team so they can kind of start getting comfortable with it. Same thing with adults, whether they're educational leaders, local leaders, or business leaders. You know, just, just that building that social network is important. But uh, I think what's more important than anything is that these people understand, at least the adults, need to understand the why. You know, I mean, a robot is a robot is a robot. Okay, it's a machine. You know, it's that's it's not a technical, tra- you know, FIRST is not a technical training organization. FIRST doesn't build robots. FIRST builds people. Okay. And I was sitting in a restaurant two days ago, and I saw something on Fox Sports or something like that on the Fox Sports channels, and they was talking about the science of sports or something. I don't know what it was. And I thank him. Of, I think it was an NCAA thing or something. That's something like 82 or 92 percent of business leaders, you know, of effective business leaders, were on a sports team in high school or college. But what the, what they're talking about here is the ability of students to work in teams and work with other people. If you talk to other, now if you just start talking to an employer and say, "Hey, I bet your biggest problem is soft skills, trying to get people to work together, 
and work as a team. And they're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's your door opener right there. You know, just forget the robot. That's what they want to talk about. That's, and, and I tell people, everybody thinks we just build robots. I feel like I spend 90% of my time just trying to build a team and just working through people issues and management issues and project management issues and time issues and money issues and, you know, just running the organization. But, yeah, you know, that's what these guys are looking to hire. And the technical part, that's just sort of a freebie thrown on the pile, right? Right. Uh, because the technical skills that whatever company they're going to go to might be different than the technical skills they learned at first. And the company can teach them that what they, what they'd rather have are, are young people who show up, who have all the other things you're talking about, the project management, yeah, that how to work on a team, how to work in a diverse and inclusive environment right. to, yeah. How to problem solve without screaming and yelling and, uh, yeah. Yeah. How I want to jump to another subject. I'm in Horry County, South Carolina right now, which is the same county with Myrtle Beach. There's an old historic team here, but the next two teams that were started, I came here and started, and one was in a high school of maybe 400 people. It's an FRC team, still there. And the other was in sort of a career academy of maybe seven or 800 people. That team's still there. So you're talking about the size of the Indiana schools. Yeah. But one of the things those two schools did was they drew – but they also drew students from surrounding uh, high schools in the county, which is only maybe six high schools in the whole county. But I think the county has like five teams now. Um, but yes, it did work in the smaller schools because the businesses were behind it, and it was, it was important to them. And you know, there's, they they figured it out. You know, it works. Have they done okay in terms of uh, mentor recruitment and retainment? I think they're doing okay. Yeah, I think the uh, I think it's been very stable as far as I can remember. Uh, all the names that I know are with the teams are fairly stable. Have been for ten years, eight years. Um, money's been okay. Um, I know a couple of them's won uh, the regionals a couple of times, a few times. That's the Palmetto Regional. Well, that's good. Yeah, so they're doing all right. And you know, you're talking about a high school that's got 400 people. That's yeah, yeah. We have, yeah, and we do have a few uh, here in Indiana that do compete uh, at the FRC level that are right around that, and uh, a couple that are less than that. Uh, that uh, yeah, year to year, year to year, uh, might uh, the what I do tend to hear from our teams, um, the thing that they are most concerned about is funding, um, but uh, second, right up near it is mentor recruitment and retainment, and I, I would say that's honestly probably the bigger deal over time is is having a really good solid base of of consistent mentors uh that can help um especially with some team growth if you don't bring in some extra mentors to kind of balance out that that mentor to student ratio um yeah it can be it can be really tough dealing with the, the mentor that you talk about yeah the mentor issue is you know really the biggest hurdle uh <clears throat> i know money is a struggle and i don't want to yeah. just miss the money but you know, if you if you can get out there and explain the why and the impact, and uh, how this program really differentiates itself from other programs, it's not just a skills program. Nothing wrong with just a skills program, but we try to do a little beyond that. Um, I mean, you look at your marching band programs and your basketball and your football programs and stuff. You know, once people kind of understand it and get bought into it, you know, they'll find the money somehow. Seems like they always do. Right. Uh, with the right organization in place. And a lot of those have been around a long time and, and have solid parent organizations, but, uh, booster clubs. And, uh, and th that's crucial when, when the coach can show up and coach and not have to worry about, uh, you know, ordering uh, t-shirts or doing fundraisers. If, if there's a strong organization behind him or her to, uh, to run all that other stuff, then uh, now you have a head coach who can step in and, and, she can run the team and she can coach the, the kids on the skills and, and do the things that she needs to do. And uh, the parents can make arrangements for hotels and feed, you know, the, back onto the robotic side of things uh, during build season, look at how we're going to feed the kids on Saturdays when they're in the shop all day or yeah. uh, traveling. So yeah, being able to have that structure in place to allow mentors to mentor and, and have some other folks who can take care of the other things. Yeah. Uh, 
and that's what sports teams to have had for a long time. I don't want to dismiss the challenges of finding money and making money happen, but uh, I just finished 14 years. I'm just going back thinking through this. I've had new parents come on board and say, oh, we need to do a fundraiser or something. And I'd have a meeting and I'd tell them, it says, if we can't not explain what we do, and this goes back to the Dutch, <clears throat> this goes back to the Harvard videos shared with you. If we can't explain what we do and raise the money that way, then um, I'm going to retire from this. <laughs> um, and we have only done one fundraiser in 14 years. And it may have been the only fundraiser in 16 years of the team history <clears throat> and that was and actually that was imposed to us my first meeting i ever went to as a mentor uh i didn't realize it but i was getting sucked into the head mentor but our main sponsor general electric came in they used to give us 7500 dollars in those days and the guy says you know we guys we need to have a fundraiser we got to raise some money and he's like i don't know we're going to come up with 7500 dollars so the gd guy says uh Let's do a car wash. You want to do a car wash? Let's do a car wash. Oh, and he looks at his watch and says, I got to go to a meeting and then he leaves. <laughs> so I was like, guys, what do you want to do? He's like, I don't know. We can't raise much money at a car wash. I says, your lead sponsor just asked you to do a car wash. So we did it. We made probably 75 bucks. <laughs> and then the sponsor gave us 7,500 bucks. But you know, it was one of those teachable moments. It's like, you got to meet your sponsor in the middle. Except the middle is kind of off to the side, like a long way off to the side. But from there on, after we saw the Dutch letter thing, it's like, we have to explain the why. If we can explain the why yeah, and get people to buy into it, we're home. Well, and I think that's uh, um, one of the things I'm, I've tried to share. I'm going to be sharing out a lot more with, uh, with our teams and, and hopefully get, uh, get them to share with their students. Is, and you and I talked about this before. It is the, also the Simon Sinek uh, start with why conversation and, and really kind of take – you know, he takes you through that process of trying to define uh, the why uh, so that you can get to that. So we're, so that our teams are out there talking about the mentor experience, the, the being able to, you know, talking about the, being in this has helped me learn how to communicate, has prepared me for the workforce and has helped me become a better teammate. Oh, by the way, I, I also happen to build a robot, right? But, but yeah. it's, the, it's that, all that other better stuff. But um to kind of move on, I, I know uh, we had one other person join us, but I'm going to unmute Jim. We have Jim Langfeld from um, uh, Jim. Are you in a car? Yeah, I am. Sorry, okay, I, I'm that's going okay. to my kids' uh, concert, so I'm going to oh. have to get off here in about five or ten minutes. Oh, but okay. Ed, did, sorry, Ed, you're, Ed, you're. I'm sorry to interrupt. You're, Ed, you're fascinating to listen to. Uh, I, what, what's your background? Uh, I uh, graduated out of college way back a long time ago. I went to Washington, D.C. and worked, uh, I tell people in the spy business, I worked for a company designing uh, electronics for spy satellites and aircraft. Um, so kind of a Q-section kind of a thing. Then I came to Atlanta in 1992 at the end of the Cold War and spent 10 years in uh, telecommunications product development, then 10 years in energy management product development. And then I uh, got into the university, and so I'm one of the people in charge of supercomputing. But I got uh, I fell into this first robotics thing. I've always been thought all my life I'd like to figure out a way to get kids interested in STEM stuff or engineering. And boy, I went to the 2005 championship and was like, wow, what is this? <laughs> and I've been stuck. I've been stuck ever since. And so I'm sort of a natural entrepreneur and a natural big picture problem solver and. I saw education making a mess of the engineering education. And so I'm mm -hmm. kind of taking it off. So I'm on a mission. <laughs> nice. Well, you definitely would like to see, um, Ed, it, we'd, I'd love to have you come up sometime. I, um, uh, Jim is at Penn High School and they've been a host for us. Uh, Jim, you've been three district events for us now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, uh, and they've had a FRC uh, program in the, in the school as part of a, the school day, the class. Um, they're definitely an example of a school that's been getting STEM right for quite a long time. But um, Jim, you you guys helped us get um, a team started this year. I don't know if there's, you know, if you want to talk briefly about just kind of how that happened and as an example of how our other folks in your roles can use your position to do something like that. 
Yeah, so just, just briefly, I, I was uh, involved in a research uh, uh, college class at Notre Dame last summer, and the Mishawaka teacher was in the same class with me. So, you know, you talk about networking, that's exactly what it was. We just, we struck up a conversation, and he started coming to my lab and checking things out, and pretty soon we had him registered. So um, it, 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 it's been great to see my kids uh, you know, just embrace this, uh, breaking down the crosstown rival uh, barriers and, and having fun with that. So being a little extroverted and, and uh, reaching out to somebody in the class and taking advantage of that, I think that's a, a fantastic example. I know for our, um, the Castle team down in Evansville, uh, two years ago, they, um, instead of attending as a, as a whole team, uh, instead of attending as a whole team, the, the kickoff in Bloomington, they sent a couple of their mentors up to get their stuff and they hosted their own kickoff uh, at yeah. Castle High School. And so then what they did was, besides inviting the other Evansville area or you know, Jasper or stuff like that, and set, they invited those to come to their kickoff. But what they also did was they went to two high schools in the area and said, hey, uh, you know, we've got some connections. They made, you know, some teacher connections, student connections and said, hey, why don't you come to this event that we're doing and come check this out? Well, they all came and checked it out and spent the uh, Saturday afternoon going through the brainstorming sessions with them. And they walked out saying, hey, we want to do this too. And they said, oh, yep. well, here's who you need to talk to. Go to Indiana first. And, and so they yeah. kind of rinsed and repeated this year. Uh, and so I know several of our Indiana teams uh, do their own uh, kickoffs um, because it's not always real convenient. And also because the live stream now has made it, uh, it's a little bit easier for the schools. They don't have to get school buses and field trip permissions. Yep. Yep. And, and so, I, I mean, that. Chris, I mean, you know, my main takeaway listening to Ed is it's, it's just about changing that conversation. You know, I mean, for the first 15 years I did this, it was all about the robot and you know, it's, it's been the last eight where I've just finally been able to, to shift the conversation with parents and mentors and sponsors around the whys of, you know, what, what this is all about. So oh, I think as a group in Indiana, we, I, I think in Indiana, we've just got to do more about shifting this conversation. Um, so Great. I don't know what that looks like, but that, that, that's one of my main takeaways listening to Ed. Well, I got a, uh, this, this is Ed again. I got a uh, speech I've been running around giving town recently. I need to get it recorded and put on YouTube. It's about 30 minutes. It's the kind of a thing that you give to a Rotary Club or some group like that. And, you know, 90% of it, it's all about, about the why and the impact. And, you know, we barely talk about the robot. It's, uh, you know, and all the changed <laughs> lives. And I try to present in a way that's just really fascinating and interesting. And people just get really engaged by it. And I'll tell you, and I'm not ready to put this on a billboard yet, but uh, I was asked to join this rodeo, rodeo, Rotary Club after I gave the speech because they're looking for people because they're a service organization. It's not a business organization. Right. And the, ta the town there in Akworth, Georgia, has partnered with Selma, Alabama as a partner city. The Rotary Clubs has partnered to do social change in Selma and Selma is about 50 years behind everybody else and then the question came up how can we get some robotics teams there so you know who they tapped for that <laughs> and so so I've been having conversations I had a meeting today on the phone with Hunter Blackman of Atlanta and some other people trying to figure out how we can organize an effort to to do something in Selma now there's a thousand towns like Selma in the United States but just, the Selma is a symbol you know yeah. social change and you know that's a big why right there that's about as big as it gets <laughs> yeah yeah yep. for sure um yeah if you're me this is grant up in mr walker oh good grant grant carlisle hey chris yeah hey. yeah thanks for joining us hey jim hey adam hey, up here uh in mr walker just wanted to take out another opportunity there that i'm hearing about kind of serendipity for mentors and adults and judges, parents alike. The Mishawaka team that Jim helped start, it was neat to see as the teams that were already established, uh, Penn Robotics, the one that Jim leads, as 
Jim was around helping out FLL and FTC events and his team was out doing community outreach and they were meeting other kids from other teams. Well, that also created this opportunity for serendipity for other teams like the Mishawaka team that he helped start. They were there. And so th those other events, when an FRC team goes and helps at an FLL event, whether it's to judge or to literally just set up, all those adults there are opportunities for sponsors or judges an FRC event, or they could help start another FRC team. They're at the event. And if we, shame on us, if we think, oh, this is great for the kids, <laughs> they can meet other kids. Well, there's a whole bunch of adults standing around here too. What are we doing to recruit them? Yeah, so uh, that was, the, yeah, kind of the point is when you're in an FLL event um, and this is where we could do a lot of work to, to provide opportunities to talk about what's next, right? Yeah, exactly. Just like at up here at St. Joe, we created the next gen day to reach into the lower, uh, lower levels of FR, uh, uh, first, bring them up into an FRC so they can see what it's like, vice versa, bring the FRC and FTC to the FLL events and show them like you're saying what's next. Yeah, those opportunities for serendipity. And, and to your point, Ed, I did a couple of Ignite talks on FIRST Robotics. And people are just enamored with all the things going on around them that they didn't know. Rotary, I did one to Rotary, one to Ignite, one to Score. And just like you're saying, I had the same feedback where they're like, now high school kids are doing what? <laughs> yeah. Said, it, it starts in elementary school, guys. High school is the end. Um, you know, it's amazing. It, you know how hard it is to write a short speech. It's easy to do a long speech. So I was, oh, yeah. we were briefing one time a congressman, and I was going through all this explanation, trying to explain the psychosocial development of the students through the program, kind of like. And then I'll I started comparing it to sports and football, and I said, "Then I said, students need to students have class in a gym and have and have sports after school. We need to have." classes in the STEM gym and do continue with robotics after school. And I stopped and said, STEM gym, coined the phrase right there. We all looked at each other. Mm -hmm. And now there's probably, there's probably at least a dozen instances around the country of places that picked up on that and call it STEM gym. So about two Love days it. ago, I was, I was meeting with the original director in Georgia and we were talking about the comparison and volunteer experiences between different states. You know, some are good, some are bad. And then she said the words, the volunteer experience. So it's a stop, Connie, right there. Say that again, volunteer experience. So just like you have, you have STEM, Jim, coin that phrase right now, volunteer experience. So when you think about how you handle volunteers, think about the volunteer experience that they're going to have so that they become activated and they're dying to they come back to. and do it again. And they oh, want yeah. to get all their friends in the volunteer experience is like the experience you'd have when you went to the World Series ball game or the Disney or whatever. You want to have that energy and that feeling as opposed to, oh, here's your job, here's a clipboard, get to work kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's uh, all part of the social network. That's the, that's the social fabric, that's the social network, and that's how we activate all this and get value. Yeah. Hey, this Ed, sounds I, to me like synthesizing. Meeting, but, uh, Jim, thanks for being for on. Time. Thank yeah. you, Jim, so much. And uh, I'm Ed, I, I really hope I meet you someday, Ed. You're fascinating. So, <laughs> thank you. I'll try and get it there one day. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Jim. Bye, bye, guys. Bye. Yep. Yeah, as we uh, about uh, ten minutes or so left to the call, one of the things I wanted to share um, that I'm going to uh, put out on the recording anyway um, is that. There's a Google Drive folder that I've created that I'm going to share with the lead and alternate mentors in Indiana. Uh, that um, um, those of you, who are, two of you are just on the phone, you probably don't see this, but I'm showing this now. That it's a series of uh, recruiting documents that I've used when meeting with um, either school administrators or principals, uh, and these are things that I will be updating and, and pulling out as they get out of date. I've just updated with some of the new uh, branding stuff with First Rise and Infinite Recharge and, and things like that. Um, that and sounds it's, great. And it's good, it's good stuff. Uh, some of it's some of the higher level stuff uh, that gets at the why, the 
and some of it's specific that kind of is is more about um, you know budgetary types of things like here's the startup costs and uh, and then some of it's uh, more generic that teams could just you know um, you know they could run off a couple copies and take with them to a meeting or you know have with them at an outreach event uh, to uh, to share with folks so um, yeah so that's going to be I just shared that I'm going to stop sharing that uh, that's something that's going to go out uh, leading all alternate mentors will have access to that and, and I'll let them know too that, um, uh, that if they've got other mentors that that want access to it sometimes leading alternate mentors um, have a parent that might be more a parent mentor or somebody that might need it so I'll, I'll uh, grant them access to it and then like I said I'm just going to move stuff in and out of it as it's um, as it ages out because some of the stuff I know on the the first website in the resource right area so some of it's really good and some of it's up to date and some yeah of it's, some of it's kind of old so <laughs> <Some of> it's not <laughs> yeah but and that's all right i mean i it's I, i'd rather them focus on getting other things than than some of that but but definitely the uh oh, yeah, yeah there's a lot there are some good resources uh there too but uh anyway so that's it i don't know um maybe just a couple of minutes last few comments i know um Ed, we've talked about advocacy. You guys have done a lot in uh, Georgia. Um, I, I, this whole call was really around kind of how to start FRC teams in and around your area. And I think what we really got out at the heart of all of this was networking, uh, getting out there and talking to folks and finding ways to, especially young people, uh, to get them engaged and excited uh, by visiting shops, by you know playing with the robots, or by seeing it, or by getting them in to visit on a on a kickoff event, or 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 invite them to be a part of your team if if your district or your club or whatever allows you to do those kinds of things uh, to incubate type stuff. But really, it's the networking is is what I'm yep. hearing. Um, and then uh, you guys have also worked. Um, in Georgia to move first into the role of, of being a CTSO, which is the same level as FFA uh, and several right. other organizations like that. Um, I guess maybe just, um, I don't know if you can talk a little bit about how long that's taken and what that process has been like. Well, it was sort of a game of intergalactic chess, but um, you know, start already. So we did our first political briefing in September of 2009, and they're really more informational briefings more than asked. But we kept getting better at it, and I kept getting better at it, and then that's what led me to actually joining the policy school at Georgia Tech. It's like you know, I can learn a lot more about this. And um, one thing that I've really learned from the school of hard knocks, and again from the policy school, is that the biggest problem I think most people have is lining up the correct ask with the correct decision maker. Um, I don't want this to come off and sound like I'm knocking the National Advocacy Conference. Um, but you know, it was a big effort to go to Washington and learn how to advocate and that kind of stuff, and that's great, and I haven't been to the thing. But uh, walking around, there's a lot of things that you people might ask for walking around Congress that they don't have the legislative authority to manage. But the only thing that they can do is ESSA, Title IV, Section 1, or 1A, I think. Um, most of the action, everybody thinks uh, federal government's a, a big dog or not. They're a yap dog. The big action is in the state level. And even at the state level, trying to figure out whether it's a legislative ask, a governor ask, um, our education ask, or a local district ask. You know, that takes some work to figure that out. And you might wind up with multiple asks at multiple levels, which is really how it works in real life. So lining those ask up, but to get the CTSO thing, it took about two years of laying out some dominoes. And I actually went, me and another guy met with a very big player in the state government, and we we're trying to lay out what we we're trying to get to. He said, okay, you need to make, you need to meet three or four people that he laid out and get to know those people. And we did that. And one of those, and then we met another person, which was, part of one of the largest manufacturing employers in Georgia. And we started a team there and then we went to St. Louis and then he's like, yeah, we got to get this thing fixed. And we're calling Lieutenant Governor from St. Louis <laughs> setting up this meeting. So we came back in 2016 and at 11 o'clock we finished the meeting on Friday the 13th of May. And I can remember that because it's 13, 11, the 13th day of the last hour, 13, 13, 11. We had it all lined up Everybody had the same voice. The lawyers had it all figured out. We got it all done in one meeting. 
We made Georgia the first CTSO in the country to support FIRST. So, but that took about two years of work of social network building and getting some people educating and getting the ducks in a row. Okay. Now, the advantage every other state in the United States has right now, anytime you go to these kind of meetings, they always say, well, what's the other states doing? Okay. To that date, it was zero. Right. That problem doesn't exist anymore. Now you can say, Georgia's doing it, right. and they got a thousand teams K through 12. <laughs> wow. Okay. And there's statistical data that shows, you know, we didn't have, you know, some of those teams existed with CTSO, but what happened was there was a significant uptick in teams on that, in that next program year, next academic year. But again, it was to the Y, it was the political connections out in the political poll. Uh, a lot of policy is about building consensus. Most people think policy is about going and like asking your parents for a, a, a raise in your allowance. That's not the way government works. The way government works is it's hard to get things done because you have to have the consensus of a whole lot of people. It may or may not be the legislator body, but rarely does somebody do something on their own. They're going to want a lot of support from everybody kind of in their space to say, hey, what do you think? You think this is a good idea? You think this is going to work? Does that make sense? No, it makes absolute sense. And, uh, and yeah, that right, makes a lot of sense. It is a long process. And I, I think that's, um, I think we're in a good spot right now because we just had a, a budget year wrap up at this wouldn't have been a good year for us to try to do things, but now that we've got this, you know, year and a half, um, uh, two year uh, to start uh, laying the groundwork, we uh, we have a lot of opportunity. So, because we haven't done a lot of state level uh, advocacy here in Indiana, I say we, I mean our teams. Um, we've had some do a little bit. Um, it just to me, instead of saying we haven't really done any, to me it's more we have a huge opportunity to do a lot. So, um, so I got something for you to think about. That is definitely I, true. <laughs> I got something for you to think about. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote a policy memo to the governor of New Jersey on behalf of some teams up there. I don't know if they presented it to him or not. I know they had a meeting schedule with their policy advisors. That's the policy advisor. You got to get all the policy advisors bought in first, really. Um, well, maybe not first, but you do have to get them bought in because they're the people that really make things happen. So I was explaining to them, says, you guys sound like you're just going to go and say, I want more first. Well, that's great. You know what? There's a line of people at the governor's office. That's all they ask for all day is, I want X. Right. Okay. You got a, you got a horse trade here. It says, dear governor, you have a big HR problem, I think, if I have my guess right. You need STEM workforce and you need STEM teaching workforce. Guess who's got both or can provide both? We can, but we need help. <laughs> right. so, yeah, it's, it sort of becomes transactional. So there's I love something that positioning. We, <laughs> right. And so I've run the numbers nationally in every state. I know what the teacher production is. Honestly, Indiana's better than most states and even, but that's not saying much in terms of teacher production. Because Georgia was sitting at zero for a lot of local fields. Most states are. Um, but I've been working on this teacher development model. I'm actually writing a roadmap right now. I'm trying to get the first draft out here in about a week of how we make 21st century teachers for the STEM fields, engineering, technology, uh, math, so manufacturing, you know, computer science, AI, the whole deal. Where are we going to get these people from? Okay, I'm going to lay out. Here's where we get the people from. These are the kind of teacher degree programs that you need to go through at Purdue and Indiana and East Tennessee and UGA, Kennesaw State and Georgia Southern. And I think there's a chance I'm going to be able to partner with the Harvard Graduate School of Education on this project. And But what that does, by somewhat having a group consensus on something, I've sketched out about eight universities. If I can get all of them to be party to this model of education, there's comfort in numbers, and I wrote down Indiana and Purdue on that list of eight or ten. That's probably about ten now. Universities that that could really help a lot in terms of building a CTSO and state funding for first. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, definitely looking forward to that. I think that um, the 
the roadmap idea and, and definitely the the idea of um, working with policy advisors first uh, and and then just along the way trying to encourage our teams to to get any form of legislative um, activity going from just inviting a state rep to visit their shop to learn more about first so they even know what it is and then also talking I think the big thing for us is that it's about increasing access um, I don't think I don't think first is looking for money or the teams aren't we're gonna make specific asks but if we can broaden the ask to uh, say look at this amazing program that these that there are certain schools that currently have and the impact it's having imagine if all schools in Indiana had access to this program and so that's how the state legislature can help well I want to push back slightly on just a little bit on something you said about not just any ask one thing I've learned is you want to be very precise in your ask so that the alignment is you got to align the ask to the per you got to align the ask to the people that can make it which is where the nac kind of messes up they're trying to do state ask at a federal level you want to do the state ask at the state so and you can that's been my say, experience with nonprofits. every time i have aligned the beneficiaries in my ask to a sponsor or some sort of supporter always making that connection it's always gone so much better for me oh yeah the alignment's really important so okay you lay out an objective for indiana and you know and somebody's gonna say well you're speaking on my head well somebody well this is our opinion so <laughs> you could say if, if, but i mean you know somebody's got to stick your neck out yeah right? yeah yeah you know and I, got, I got accused of that so like well if you don't want the money you don't have to take the money okay if right. you go if you can sell a better deal just go up to the hill and sell it you know knock me out i don't care <laughs> but we, but we, what we have to have is if you can't go and just say just please help because you know what somebody's going to be in their office in 15 minutes and they're going to say please help too right yeah yeah so there's this thing called the that art of the work. right there's go this ahead. whole thing that we have to learn how to do like a tech called how to write a policy memo we ad identify a problem we analyze it we write up a very short concise Here's what it's going to do. Here's what's going to be the impact. Here's what it's going to cost. Here's the, and literally they have to be able to turn and hand this to one of the policy people and say, go execute that line. Yeah. So I went to the, I went to the dome and right, oh, five days after the inauguration about Lieutenant governors and we had four bullet points and the fourth one was there just for completeness. I already knew they were going to do it, which is the pay raise. But the other three, they looked at us and said, okay, execute every one of these now we didn't get them all through the legislature but they direct it was directive execute these three line items well uh i can't thank you enough for your time it's eight o'clock uh we're gonna yeah. get this to an hour um ed thank you so much uh, i want to thank uh jim langfelt from pen 135 joining us and, and talking a little bit about his experience grant thanks for being here um and uh and definitely thanks so much yeah i this has been a fantastic conversation uh and again i can't thank you enough for the generosity not only for the conversation today but yesterday your your time uh pre-conversation talking about this stuff mm -hmm. look forward to getting to know you better and uh and definitely want to head down your way to um, see some georgia stuff in action i know we've sent some some teams to georgia in the inner district uh stuff and have, uh, they've come out uh, enjoying their time we've had some indiana teams at the peach tree uh, yeah there. yeah we so uh go yeah. down there at championships that was a fun yeah. time yeah oh yeah so uh next action items i don't know if you have any action items i i do um i want to get this roadmap put together and then i want i'd like to get an introduction to indiana and purdue okay. and get people just to look at it and start thinking about it yeah and uh and i have got some conversations going up at harvard and i'd like to add this whole project that i'm developing into the harvard pathway to prosperity network and see if we can't form a consortium of eight or ten or twelve universities just to see if we can nail down a consensus on this thing because the consensus is important if you get those 12 universities i just named yeah. to be a consensus on this issue that's a game changer yeah and if you're open to it i'd love to get indiana university on that list uh, they have yeah, quite a yeah. few NSF grants. That what did I say? Indiana, Indiana State or Indiana no, University? You, no, you said Indiana. You said Purdue. Um, I said Purdue, I said Purdue and Indiana. 
Yeah. I said Indiana. Great. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I'd yeah. love to help uh, connect you with IU if if that's a, a thing on your list. Oh, it's on my list. It's on my target. Yeah. <laughs> I just great. I just didn't know any the only person I ever knew from Indiana was Andy Baker, and that was it. All right. Well, we like Andy. <laughs> And yeah. uh, that's a that's a good stop. That's a good place to stop. We like Andy Baker. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> we all like Andy Baker. Uh, yeah. And, and we, thanks uh, so much for putting this together, Chris. Yeah, Great. no problem. Uh, thanks so much. And and Ed, we'll be in touch. And we'll uh, uh, yeah, anything okay. I can do to connect you to folks. And um, uh, anyway, thank you so much. And everybody have a good evening. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right.